You're listening to The Story Connective. In this episode, you'll hear stories about wild food and wild wisdom. I wanted to choose foods, like 13 foods, because this was more about like, if we needed to survive, we so could as a human species survive no matter where we live, because these plants are everywhere in the world, next to where we live. Welcome to The Story Connective. I'm Rebecca Rhapsody. And I'm Loxley Clovis. The Story Connective shares inspiring stories of possibility, resilience, and cooperation. Today, we have a story-filled interview with Katrina Blair, author of The Wild Wisdom of Weeds. This book is a forager's guide to ultimate food security. Few people have sparked my imagination more about what it means to be resilient than Katrina Blair. I find her wisdom deeply rooted in practicality and artistry. I first heard of Katrina while listening to the Permaculture Podcast, and I was awed by her presence and the information she has cultivated and shares. In her book, she has identified 13 global survival plants, commonly considered weeds in American culture, that are nutritious, medicinal, improve soil health, and naturally grow in abundance with absolutely no human effort. These plants are free, accessible to everyone, and grow everywhere humans live on every major continent, from the Arctic Circle to the dry, hot desert. And her book includes more than 100 nutrient-dense, easy-to-follow recipes on how to use these plants for food, medicine, and self-care. I think she's so cool. So, when Loxley and I were passing through Durango, Colorado during my birthday week, I knew that I wanted to stop by Katrina's Turtle Lake Cafe where they serve up culinary dishes of wild harvested weeds. Turtle Lake Cafe is a wild cafe and restaurant, and we do mean wild. We had cattail herb bread, local wild salad, wheatgrass lemonade, moringa pad thai, and mint mallow truffles. And it was actually really good. Born from a community struggle to keep a local wetland habitat wild and free, Turtle Lake Refuge Cafe serves up delicious lunches of wild harvested, locally grown, and fresh living foods year round every Tuesday and Friday. Turtle Lake Refuge is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild lands through promoting and engaging in wild land stewardship practices. The proceeds from the cafe benefit the refuge. Katrina Blair's life work has changed the way I see plants around me and introduced me to some really great plant allies, such as plantain, yellow dock, and purslane. Purslane's probably my favorite. It's got more omega-3s than any other leafy vegetable on earth. It's tasty. It's got tons of vitamin C, great for skin health, great in salads, soups, stir fries, kind of like spinach, and it grows in abundance all by itself, no human effort in a garden near you. Soon after our visit to Durango, we were pulling weeds in a garden and realized that we were pulling out lots of purslane. But actually, if you keep it in the garden, it keeps the soil protected from the wind and the sun, acting as a living mulch. Now, all our gardener friends keep this quote-unquote weed in the ground and only harvest it to eat or to make space to plant something new. And purslane is just one of the 13 plants known as weeds that Katrina covers in her book. But more on that later. After our wild lunch at the Turtle Lake Cafe, we were thrilled to sit and chat with Katrina Blair, whose positivity genuinely overflows. I think it comes from her passion and her commitment to the wild lands and what they do for the resilience of the human spirit. I find her inspiring, and I hope you will too. talk a little bit about Turtle Lake Refuge. Mm -hmm. How long have you had that piece of land or been a protector of that piece of land? Since uh, 92. Since 92. And you found that piece of land because you you saw a for sale sign, right? And it was going to become a development and you called and raised the money by... Yeah, so there's two different stories simultaneously. I was living in a teepee on some land and um, I was paying some rent and I was like, I don't want to pay rent to live in a TV. So I ended up deciding to like buy some land. And that's actually two acres and that's become the community farm. Mm. And, um, but then there's, there were 60 acres of land that was for sale after that, that 
someone wanted to do a big subdivision and we were like that's a bad idea <laughs> let's do something else so we started raising the money mm-hmm. by doing these wild food lunches and that was like in 98 97 98 and we actually ra- you know we did that for a whole year where we we didn't have a place yet like this is our cafe space um but we went we would just put everything on this three-wheel bicycle and pedal it over to this community building like five blocks away wow. and we stored our tables and chairs in their closet and we turned into a makeshift cafe twice a week and it was five dollars a plate and it was to raise money to buy this land or bring awareness to this land and it worked in the sense we didn't raise five hundred thousand dollars that year but we raised enough awareness that a neighbor bought it and then they put it into a conservation easement, oh, like cool. the whole 47 acres. And then we raised enough money to help pay for the stewardship fee of the conservation easement, but they ended up just doing it independently. Mm. So um, we might've helped, <laughs> <laughs> but it was definitely, and then after that land got protected, we realized like our mission wasn't just one piece of land, it's wild lands everywhere on planet earth. So mm. we wanted to keep going and then we decided, wouldn't it be easier if people came to us for lunch instead of us carting all of our dishes <laughs> and all the workhorse meal to this place? So then we made a commercial kitchen here, and, and now this is the cafe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, We had lunch here the other day. It was really delicious. Good, Just, yeah. Mm, really high-nutritional food. I could yeah. feel it for the Culinary the artists, for great. sure, oh, are so good. in the kitchen. Yeah, we got an extra piece of elderberry pie. Oh, good. Which was great because it was my birthday. And she <laughs> Your birthday? Know that, and she gave me an extra piece of pie. It was, was my like, birthday. Oh, really? Are, are you, you June 21st? I am. Me too. Oh, my so goodness. Sweet. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, that was my birthday cake. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Hmm. Just to finish a little bit of that story, the land that that you helped raise awareness to by you and your community, it's a lake and it's a wetland, right? Mm -hmm. So that was part of the reason why you guys wanted to conserve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's turtles that live there. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful lake. And you personally have had a lot of experience just living off of wild foods, right? I think I read someplace that you lived in a lean-to for a whole summer (laughs) after high school. (laughs) Right, yeah. What was that like? And was was that one of your first times really just living off of wild foods? Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. That was like my first like diving in, sort of like, I want to just for the whole summer eat wild foods. But I ended up bringing a little cereal with me, Mm -hmm. like a little buckwheat, flax seeds and sunflower seeds. And I would soak that overnight and then eat it for breakfast. But I didn't bring any other food. So I would dig up salsify roots and eat bluebell leaves and there were service berries, all the different kinds of berries. But mostly, you know, I just learned that so much that first summer and it was like that first two weeks of being alone out there. I was actually kind of, I was totally afraid of just like people coming and finding me or just, I was like all the horse movies I saw as a kid, you know, they would come up. So I had this little like hand axe (laughs) that I would chop wood with and I would sleep with it by my pillow and it was like, okay, if anything happens, this is my plan. And I would just go over that so I could sleep. And of course nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And then after that two weeks, that fear disappeared and it's never returned. So Mm -hmm. yeah. What inspired you to want to go and do something like that? Well, I Live think I, I landed an amazing sweet spot of a family because uh, my mom really inspired me to be the master of my own health because she mm. got arthritis when she was 17 and went through 17. 12 years of Western medical surgeries and drugs and all the side effects. And, and then she got inspired to do a juice fast when I was two years old. And after four days of juicing, her pain went away. Wow. And she was like, what? What have I been missing this entire time from all the you know, the doctors and everything. And she started studying herself and really finding how she could prevent her own pain through green juices and through fresh living foods. And and she doesn't have arthritis anymore. So she, you know, really led me in the health. When we started right after she had that juice fast, as a family, she started, my brother and I, we would do green juices twice a day Mm -hmm. and a lot of living foods our whole life. So we never got sick. (laughs) Wow. But then my dad, he's a geologist and he was really passionate about climbing and mountaineering and skiing and being in the woods so he opened that whole door of adventure and wild and play and so when I just bring those two together it was like oh wild food is the most optimal hell path and mm-hmm. joyful to go trapsing around the mountains <laughs> anyway that's awesome. so that's how I came to that to talk a little bit more about this mission, it says Turtle Lake Refuge's mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild land, or rather the connection between the local ecology and our own personal health. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, the more we take care of our own little body, the more we naturally take care of the big earth body, and the more we take care of the earth body, we are naturally taken care of, like, individually. So mm -hmm. there's just this incredible immediate relationship. And so we focus on local food and wild food and fresh, you know, we sort of imitate the wild life as much as we can with, wow, if, you know, they, everybody else, like all the other species of the entire planet, just eat their food local, wild, and living, you know, just fresh, like right where they are. And they are amazing, you know. They, yeah. Sometimes we look at the wild animals and just like, how can they survive on what seems to be so nothing or in cold or, or how can they be so strong and run so fast? Mm. But the more as humans we imitate that way of eating, the more of that natural human instinct of wildness comes back mm. to us too. So we're just um, doing it in a gentle way of integrating it, you know, into people's lives and inspiring that path mm -hmm. and sort of learning along the way. Do you ever speak to the plants? Oh, Do you always. ever communicate with them? All the time. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I mean, anytime I harvest a plant, I always say thank you. And I tune in, too, of just asking, like, permission. And then I only harvest what I need. And then they communicate back. And, and a lot of times it just has to do, like, it might just be an entire image that comes. Or, mm. like, a direction or an inspiration or sometimes even words. But, yeah, their communication, I think everything is communicating all the time like everything and so it's really fun to get into that receptive place of listening deep listening where we're guided and we're open and receptive and mm -hmm. yeah for a turtle lake refuge is i think you wrote in your book someplace and i've heard other land practitioners talk about really listening to the land and what it wants to become is that something that you found happens at turtle lake or? Mm, yeah i mean at the farm and here too but at the farm that's a kind of a wild permaculture garden and very much like the land tells us what to do like the wild plants and the trees and I mean just everything yeah there's a whole symphony <laughs> of direction <laughs> that we follow mm -hmm. yeah does music and play take a role in the work that you do yeah yeah I, I love singing and I'm, I'm always singing whenever I <laughs> walk on walkabouts I have songs that come through and and we have a little band called the Dandelions, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, we sing a lot, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that your band is called the Dandelions, because that's another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, mm. the, the story there. Yeah. So it sounds like an initiative, a movement that you all were raising awareness about mm. a while ago was Dandelions. Yeah. And that was perhaps one of the first wild weeds that you really started promoting and telling people about. Yeah. And what happened? Well, that's because the dandelions were the kind of the focus on the parks, all the city parks. They get they used to get sprayed with herbicides mm -hmm. to kill the dandelions, and so we started working with the city, saying we wanted organic parks, and we got one park. The city said, "Yeah, sure, we'll give you one park as a trial." So we used compost tea, and we had weed parties and harvesting parties, and put up a bat box so they didn't even spray for mosquitoes. Nice. And then the next year, we asked for two parks. And they said, sure. Okay, second park. So that was great. And then they took over the management of them. But then we asked for more parks. And they're like, no, <laughs> you people have a choice out of, you know, 50 parks. We had two. And that wasn't good enough for us. So we got together with this lawyer. And he helped us write a city ordinance. Mm -hmm. And we put it on the ballot the same year marijuana was on the ballot. So we knew it was going to pass. <laughs> so all the weedy people would come out. <laughs> and so they knew it was going to pass too. And our city ordinance was really strict. It was like, we want 100% all the parks organic and city property. And that mm -hmm. included the golf course. We didn't realize how much it included. So there was so much, like, you know, conflict. And it was like front page of the newspaper for three months. And I was kind of the hit person for a little while. <laughs> it was wow. intense city council meetings. So... We folded a thousand cranes for peace for organic parks, and they're upstairs. And in the process of that, a lot of magic happens. But and then we wrote like a letter out to everyone. And actually, it was in February, but a honeybee landed on the letter before I like sent it out <laughs> to everyone, photocopied it. And but we ended up raising fifty-one thousand dollars to help the city buy um, an organic truck, like their own sprayer truck. And we ended up deciding. Instead of just push it through, because they were like, take it off the ballot. And and we decided, okay, let's negotiate with the city instead of push it through. So we sat down with all the city managers and Parks and Rec people and, and came up with a resolution. And it wasn't as powerful, we realize now, but that's okay. So that got passed unanimously, and then they shifted over to a third of the parks. 
organically the next year. Nice. Um, so. And when you mean organic, like organic means parks, what does that mean? No to you? chemical herbicides or fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's they're using like overseeding practices and mowing a little higher mm, and putting compost and like organic um, nutrients on there. Mowing a little higher is one of those things that I wish more people knew about. Yeah, eventually. that's simple and so, so simple. Saves water. Yeah. <laughs> saves and fertilizer. not that often, like a little mm -hmm. less, right? Exactly. Um, and speaking about really easy things like that, yeah. that brings me to your book, The Wisdom of Wild Weeds. And in that book, you talk about 13 different plants that you can find all over the world that grow plentifully and abundantly. Let's talk a little bit more about how you've really broken it up. Like, why did you choose those 13 plants? What yeah. are their functions? Yeah, well, um, what I started noticing is that when I would travel around the world, I would just notice these same plants were following me, like no matter where I went, like the Philippines or Japan or Alaska or Hawaii, or I was like, oh, there's amaranth, there's lamb's quarter, there's plantain, there's mallow, there's dandelion, of course. So I just started thinking about, well, how many of these plants are really doing this? And so I had to narrow it down. And there were a couple other plants that were like maybes. But then when I would really do more research, they didn't they either fit everything. Because I, I wanted to choose foods, like 13 foods. Because this was more about like if we needed to survive, we so could as a human species survive mm -hmm. no matter where we live. Because wow. these plants are everywhere in the world next to where we live. So I wanted them to be foods well. first and then um, medicines also, but not only that mm -hmm. yeah so foods medicines also and then a lot of these plants too do something to the soil right Where they, they all grow. do yeah they help regenerate that compaction and disturbance that we're so good about making mm. <laughs> so they're permaculture plants really like they do this incredible multitasking action of breaking up the compacted soils and tying in like really deep minerals and pulling them into their leaves and then their leaves compost and rebuild the topsoil oh, and then they're the awesome. pollinating like all the bees and the wild pollinators use them and then their food and medicine for us too that's really great yeah, yeah. We, we lived someplace that we had to walk through a, a lawn to get there. It was kind of a bit of a wild lawn. You probably would have liked it. Yeah. And we noticed that just where we'd walk every single day, very quickly the plants wouldn't grow there anymore because of that compact mm -hmm. and that disturbance that you're talking about. Right. So you're saying that a lot of these plants will come in there and they'll be some of the first plants that can grow yeah. there again. That's it. And, and to break it up. Right. And so more life can grow there after that. So exactly. they kind of rewild They our rewild steps. our steps. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Way to say that. <laughs> That's a nice quote. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fantastic. They do that. They're that, pr they're that primary succession. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they'll lead to the more native plants being able to return. In the book, The Wild Wisdom of Weeds, Katrina gives information on the following 13 survival plants. Dandelion, mallow, purslane, plantain, thistle, amaranth, dock, mustard, grass, chickweed, clover, lamb's quarter, and knotweed. For each plant, she gives a description of the plant family, the historical relationship between the plant and how people have used it all over the world. I love that part. Its nutritional profile, its edible and medicinal uses, and many recipes of how to prepare the plant yourself. And these plants naturally grow and are available free of charge anywhere humans live. I think it's awesome. For example, got an itchy bug bite? Plantain is a plant that's sure to be nearby and can help instantly. You can identify it quickly and apply it to the itchy area and the itch stops. I've done it dozens of times. It's also highly nutritious and edible in myriads of ways. People have been eating plantain and using it medicinally since prehistoric times and throughout Europe, Asia, and the Americas. It's also amazing medicinally. It draws out toxins and helps heal wound infections. No need to buy something from the drugstore. You can find this cure in your own backyard. That's just one of the weeds in this book. Let's hear Katrina tell us about what she does with some other wild weed plants, such as mallow. So let's, let's talk about one of these wild plants a little bit and get into a little bit more about okay. how you present them in your book. For example, mallow. Yeah. Mallow is one of these plants that you can find in a lot of different places and you can eat the leaves. Yeah, the you whole thing. You can also eat the roots, yeah. just the whole thing, Yeah. all of it. And mallow is a really interesting green because you also provide lots of recipes on how mm -hmm. to enjoy these wild foods. Yeah. And I haven't tried mallow yet. I'm just one oh. of those people that's maybe like, how do I do this? Yeah. Which is why I appreciate your book. Um, that you can go out there and collect mallow, 
I know it goes in Houston, for example. Yeah. That's a place where I'd see it all over the place. Mm -hmm. And the leaves actually turn sweet, or they, they can very quickly become they parts kind of like of a sauce or a, yeah, yeah. a salad dressing, or yeah. not just eating the greens, but you can do a lot of stuff with it. Because they have this mucilaginous quality, uh -huh. a little bit slimy, because they're, the they're in the same family as okra. So today, this morning, I just made marshmallows mm -hmm. <laughs> with the mallow plant, and I just harvested the plant, the whole thing. The whole thing. And I said thank you. And then washed <laughs> up the root and all, and then chopped it up and put it in water. And within really like probably an hour or less, it starts to turn into like mallow slime. Wow. Like mallow water, I call it. But it's almost like egg white consistency. Wow. And so you just let the mallow soak in water, and then you've got this great base for food and like lotion and... But we ended up using the mallow water and soaking some chia seeds mm. and then blending um, the rest of the mallow parts in water with an avocado and honey and vanilla and the chia. And it turns into this really thick goo. And then we just dehydrate them into marshmallows. Wow. And so they're drying right now. And then they'll be ready tomorrow. And you can just like eat them. And then they're just these green marshmallows. Green marshmallows <laughs> made out of mallows. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Yeah. Like, who would think that you put this plant in water and it's going to thicken I the know. water like that? Right. So cool. And then with the mallow root too, and other parts of the mallow too, but I, I read that mallow root is really great for your teeth. Yeah. Well, you can brush your teeth with them. Mm -hmm. Like you turn them into a toothbrush because they're so fibrous and then they yeah. dry, but then the little bristles stay soft and <laughs> it's fun to play around with like different designs, you know? Mm -hmm. And they help yeah. detoxify your gums. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. It's Draw amazing. out any congestion and like whatever we might, uh, any acidity and stuff. Yeah. Another thing I read in your book is how a lot of these different plants like mallow, they have vitamins just like so vibrant in them. And so instead of maybe going and procuring this little pill that's got other things besides the vitamin in it that maybe your body knows how to absorb, maybe not, you could just pick mallow leaves or yeah. pick dandelion roots and blend them up in a coffee grinder. Yeah, dry them and then oh, make right, your own. Oh, dry them. <laughs> that <laughs> then, would be important. <laughs> yeah, and then you've got this green supplement, really, green powder that's yeah. packed with nutrients. Like more, like dandelions have more calcium than milk. Wow. by far and lamb's quarter so much iron mm. and these things that we don't get when we're eating traditional commercially grown foods from the stores mm -hmm. and so it's yeah such a blessing and it's all for free right. <laughs> they're so generous with us what does resilience mean to you resilience is such a great word i think human beings are incredibly resilient <laughs> growing up in all kinds of environments and we thrive and survive and but resilience for me personally, it's working with wherever we have, wherever we are and wherever we have, and thriving. I guess it's just that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Here's my yeah. last question yeah. for you. So I get the sense that your worldview and your inner worldview is relatively different from mainstream westernized culture. And I'm curious, how have you been cultivating that confidence and that mm. resilience, that, that strength to continue to speak with your own truth and your mm. own worldview even when it can get a little complicated yeah yeah great question I think there's something about like sometimes when we start something we might even think we're crazy <laughs> and then yeah. the world might think we're crazy but if we stick with it mm. like even if it doesn't go far at first if we just stay steady time starts to like I don't know, almost like accumulate on your side and it starts to build or momentum starts to carry. And so there's that piece. And then I also think it comes down to such a deep trust where mm. and we all know those moments when we're really trusting. And sometimes we have to like really practice it at the hard times. <laughs> really trust this moment. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. But just the continuation of reminding ourselves to trust, like really the divinity and everything and like that everything is in the divine perfect moment like things that happen are actually right on cue and usually we don't always know until we look back like wow if that didn't happen then this couldn't happen and connecting the dots in yeah. retrospect so mm -hmm. there's this place where we can start to relax and then when we relax we can start to listen to that deep intuition and those mm. those guidances yeah well thank you so very You're much welcome. We send sincere gratitude to Katrina and her team at Turtle Lake Refuge Farm and Cafe for the inspiration your wild work has given us and so many others.
You can learn more about Katrina Blair and Turtle Lake Refuge at www.turtlelakerefuge.org. And if you're ever in Durango, Colorado, have lunch at the Turtle Lake Refuge Cafe. All the proceeds go to Turtle Lake Refuge and protecting wild lands. Plus, it's tasty. The cafe is open for lunch every Tuesday and Friday, year-round, from 11.11 a.m. to 2.22 p.m. Also in Durango, during the first weekend of May, be sure to visit the Dandelion Festival, organized and held by Katrina and her wild-loving crew in one of the city's organic parks. If you have enjoyed the Story Connective podcast, please consider subscribing to our podcast, so that way you'll be sure to hear all of our episodes. And please leave us a review. We love hearing from you, and it really helps us get the word out. The Story Connective is 100% listener and viewer supported. We share these stories because we believe that the stories we see and hear shape what we think it's possible, and we want more people to be inspired and educated and to be a part of a positive future. If you support Story Connective's 501c3 mission and vision of bringing stories of resilience and possibilities to the world, please make a donation. We run on donations, and we really appreciate your support. You can make a one-time donation at www.storyconnective.org or become a patron. That means you give us a donation each time we create a piece of content. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash storyconnective. Or you can use the Be a Patron button on the Podbean podcast app. Thank you so much for your support. Interview by Rebecca Rhapsody at storyconnective.org. Audio recording and audio production by Loxy Clovis at storyconnected.org. The intro song is Which That Is This by Dr. Turtle, released under the Creative Commons Attribution License. The outro song is by Rebecca Rhapsody. Special thanks to our nonprofit fiscal sponsor, Elsa, at ELLSSA dot ORG. The purpose of this audio interview is for nonprofit education news and commentary. This podcast is released under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Like License. Thank you for listening to the Story Connective. Thank you. You that too. Was really fun. Great questions. <laughs> awesome. Really appreciate you yeah. taking the time to come and and visit. Yeah, like <laughs> I said, I was I'm still thrilled that it worked out. Yeah. And we have the same birthday. I know that's the amazing. best birthday too, <laughs> right?